Great. So, uh, great to be with everyone. Um, uh, we're going to be discussing today uh, chapter 11 of Theory of Abstraction. Um, and this chapter, of course, focuses on small, what Eugene Cheng terms small mathematical structures. And there's several examples of this. Um, uh, small drawable examples. So here we, we can present a, a category by drawing it out. Um, maybe someone could get the door if you wouldn't mind. Um, it's great. Uh, thanks super much. Sorry for the trouble. Uh, monoids. Monoids, um, which um, are treated in both a categorical form and sort of for a theme that is going to be uh, followed from, from many chapters in this book. Also, in a more traditional set theoretic non categorical form. Um, uh, and of course, those are linked to groups. Um, and uh, she provides as well a, a non categorical definition of a group um, and uh, talks about the relationship of groups and categories and, and of course, and of course uh, equivalence relations and categories. And then there's an intriguing final section, 11.4, on that is more topological in nature. It has to do with points and paths through space and connectivity and, um, and the idea of, of capturing points and paths as, as a category. And this notion of sameness is something that has to be sort of uh, considered carefully um, in what sense two paths between the given pair of points are, are the same. Um, and then thinking about sort of what the those paths tell us um, uh, genuinely, as she says, genuinely different paths tell us about the, the, the shape of the space, the sort of character of the space topologically. Um, so these are a set of different um, kind of uh, what she calls smaller structures. Um, and it turns out that um, several of these beyond building understanding will be really important in the computational epidemiology context. Um, so it turns out monoids turn out to relate directly to dynamical systems. And you may be surprised at that, but there's actually a really nice way to relate monoids to discrete dynamical systems. And I'm using this term here to mean dynamical systems which update at discrete points in time. Okay, And we'll soon see that, possibly as soon as uh, two lectures from now, next week. Um, but it turns out that small drawable examples um, of which that sort of monoid example, um, or excuse me, uh, uh, an example uh, yeah, that, that inspired the, the monoid is shown um, on page 125, but then she goes on and says it really is not really a small drawable category, but a mathematical structure of the monoid, that loop. Um, but beyond that, we have in computational epidemiology of relevance are other small drawable categories that we'll be looking at today. And those are gonna seem a little bit, um, perhaps uh, a little bit contrived until we see two times from now, how by mapping them into set, we're gonna get something that very clearly is a dynamic, dynamical system or very clearly is a stock and flow diagram or a Petri net, et cetera. Um, so uh, these are some of the topics she uh, she talks about here. Um, and uh, I, wanna, I wanna ask you, you folks, um, uh, are there any points of this chapter that you find particularly interesting or 
you know, puzzling or aspects that you want to, where you want to focus discussion. I have a bunch of slides that relate to what I just said, but if I, I, I want to make sure we prioritize the things you find interesting or puzzling or or intriguing or what have you. So any any thoughts on that? Yes, Larissa. I don't know. This, I guess this is just more of a topic. I, I appreciated the the um, relationship sort of single thing that she did with uh, the equivalent relation category group, like mm. the sort of similarities and commonalities mm. uh, based on like yeah um, objects and relations being similar to objects and arrows for a category and for group objects are the arrows as well. Yeah. I thought that was really interesting. Um, she she states on the equivalent side of the prop, the, the request for the symmetry and the decision being properly on the group side, we start writing and talking about it and the inverse of the yeah. binary operation. And I found those are still like three different things. It's like we have them for category and scope, but it's like separate. Hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. I thought it was interesting. Um, yeah, the table was was interesting, and I I have to confess I I um I'm still penetrating to the essence of some of the points she's making, but you know one of the things she emphasizes uh, quite illuminatingly I thought, and and very importantly for future chapters, um is this notion of dimension shift. And it's really intriguing. And you know, now we're hitting areas of this book where I think there's going to be a lot of things that are going to seem intriguing, and it's going to take some time for them to sink in. And I think you know, for me, it's as well some of this notion of, of, of dimension shift. I know of a lot of examples of it now from category theory, my explorations in it, but but um the the deeper side of it, which she appreciates, you know, I'm still fully chewing on. And one of the things that you see in this chapter is a very nice example of it, um, where you, you capture, for example, in a monoid, um, we capture the, uh, the notion of uh, the elements of, of a monoid through what category? Can you remember? So, so we might think of like elements of a monoid traditionally as as a bunch of kind of points, right? Um, uh, they're, they're individual elements. Where is it? Um, so we might might think of a monoid as kind of a, having a set of elements traditionally, right? Traditionally. Um, and um, she, she says, you know, the data here are the, in, in the traditional, the non-categorical notion of monoid on page 127, these are kind of the objects, as it were, right? Um, but in the categorical context, how do we capture elements? With what? Errors. Errors. And I mentioned that last time, and I could sense a certain amount of Puzzlement, and rightly so. It it really struck me as, you know, sort of a little bit, frankly, bizarre the first time I saw it. But it grows on you, and 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 it turns out to be incredibly powerful and illuminating. And you know, this is um, where she introduces, I think, this notion of dimension shift because the top of of uh, well, actually bottom of page one twenty six leads up to the top of one twenty seven. In this regard, she says the key here is that the objects called the elements of the monoid and the non categorical that's that those are those dots, right? Uh, become the arrows in the monoid in the categorical definition. And she calls this dimension shift because objects are zero dimension, um, they don't stretch out in any, any dimension. Um, you could draw a circle around them with growing size and it. The amount of stuff in it doesn't doesn't increase. Um, uh, 
at all. Um, uh, but the arrows are one dimension. Mm -hmm. And and it's a really cool idea. Um, one one thing I, I wish that maybe this could be attended to by some additional pictures in, in this context, because I think it lends itself to them. And far be it for me to compete with Eugenia Chang in, in aesthetics, but I do want to show kind of my uber crude rendition of a monoid as having sort of these, these elements. So to do this, I'm going to Rod and drag it into here, and I'm going to turn on my. Hey, hey, okay. Why, why is it not um, cooperating in terms of taking advantage of the full screen? Okay, come on. Now, okay, now, now we're stopping. Mouse land. Okay. Um, okay, no, it's. Okay, what's, what is the connectivity here? I thought it was. Underneath, no. Okay, so is it to the right? No, gonna be up. Oh, there it is. Okay, today it's up. Today my computer monitor is up from the external monitor. Okay, here we go. Um, that is good. We have some recording on, but I think it's recording. Uh, it's recording the wrong thing. Sorry, sorry. This is silly, silly IT nonsense. Okay. Um. Is anyone attending remotely? Yeah, uh, Nas Brown, can you see the? Yes. Okay, okay. Um, okay, and then we'll go down here, okay? Um, and we will, just the button to present, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so the idea here is in the monoid categorically, we might have something like this. Um, we have one object, the singleton, it's, we call it star, it's, it just is kind of a dummy object, as she calls it. It's not particularly interesting in and of itself. It's just a place we can hang these arrows, right? And, and there's an identity at all. Why is there an identity on, on this object? There has to be. There has to be some choice of matter. And then each element of the monoid, each of these things we might add, for example, or each of these things we might try to multiply or whatever, is one of these non-identity arrows. So we might have F and we might have G. And each of those shown over here on the right, more as shrewd, shrewd as it is, um, uh, you know, in correspondence with traditional monoids. So like F might correspond with A, right? Over here to the right. G might correspond with B. And then F composed with G, F after G might correspond with whatever the monoidal operation is. Maybe it's plus, A plus, right? Or maybe the monoidal operation in time. So maybe it's A times B. Now, let me ask you, why, why is it that we can compose F and G here? We, yeah, we, we have to be able to. Why why is it? We can compose any two arrows that are what? Sort of end to end, right? In general, we can compose arrows if this is F and this is G here. We can compose F and G if they're arranged end to end, right? G takes over where F like lets off, you know, lets out, right? But of course, this is perfectly fine if we kind of have each of these objects be the same. So uh, going on M just brings you back to the same object, and then going on G brings you back to the same object. That's perfectly fine. So a monoid is one of those things where any two elements can be combined. Mm -hmm. that, that's significant because all elements, it's complicated. Composition is combining atom them, times of them, or whatever. And they're all coming back to the same object. So all arrows are end to end, right? So we can combine any two elements. In a general category, that's not going to be true. We might have, might have several objects, 
and we can't always string things together. We can, can't always compose different arrows. Some arrows don't end up, don't line up end to end, right? Um, because they're between kind of um, you know, object. If if you add in a category of multiple objects, you add something from I don't know from A to B, and then you add another one from A to C. You can't compose them right um, directly because they're not end to end, right? Or if you add another arrow from I don't know from uh, from D to E here, you can't compose that with these or these because they're not end to end. So I'm saying. Once you once you start having other objects, you start to get typing, you start to have types of things, and you have restrictions on what you can compose. There's a structure there. But with a model, you have this ability to combine any two elements, which is what you have in a model, like non-categorical. You have these bunch of elements, and any two of them can be combined to yield another element, right? So this is what a monoid looks like categorically. Um, now, what's not mentioned here is the degree to which, for example, maybe F composed with G is the same as F for all we need, or maybe it's the same as F composed with itself, for example, right? Um, uh, there, we're starting to have equations that relate them, and Eugenia Chang, um, uh, in her presentation of utter brilliance, um, you know, describes this uh, like on page 128. If instead, at the very top of 120, if instead we impose an equation on some of these composites, right? Like F colon F after G is the same as F after F or something, it would no longer be a free monoid because we've imposed some constraints. Um, for example, we could declare that F squared, that is F after F, um, is a new arrow and F cubed is a new arrow, but F to the fourth power is one. So now we're getting into this notion of three structures that it turns out to be really relevant. And we'll see this quite a bit actually in the computation of the object comes to come. Um, uh, refer to, to free structures, but a free structure would be one where we have, we could compose these arrows um, and get maximum freedom when we compose arrows and getting a new one. Um, so, you know, F, F after G in general will yield something different than F. Mm -hmm. um, F after F will yield a different arrow than F after G. F after F will be different than F after F after F. We don't have any reuse of arrows. We don't have any kind of things like F to the fourth is the same as identity of them, or F squared is the same as identity. So if we have this kind of maximum freedom, we're not imposing constraints, then when we compose things, we get, you know, or we'll, we'll get get new arrows as long as the basic rules of categories apply when it comes to things like associativity and unitality. Um, uh, and I'll come back to that. But just to give an illustration of this for a particular monoid here, right? Like, like this is the categorical monoid here on the left. So maybe this arrow, the green, so first of all, we have maybe identity being zero. Why, why would identity be zero if we're considering a different with natural numbers? Why would it, why would it make sense that identity is zero? Plus zero means the same number. Plus zero. Any number plus zero is that of a number, right? And how is plus occurring here? Well, how do how do we realize the operation of the monoid? It's by doing what? By Composing arrows, right? That that's the composition of arrows in the monoid is equivalent to the minor, performing the monoidal operation on the elements associated with those arrows over here in, in the monoid. So, like, 
So like doing one post with one is the same as one plus one for this particular one. It's not the numbers plus. So it's like one plus one. You see that? You, do you get that point? Okay. So composition is like doing the monoidal operation in traditional monoid, right? And that's what this her table says, right? In in um in uh, this table in one twenty seven, towards the top of one twenty seven, that the binary operation corresponds to what? That table on the top of one twenty seven says binary operation corresponds to what? Composition. So you see, composing one. So one corresponds to one, right? Composing one with itself, doing one and then doing one. Remember, composition has takes two arrows and by says if you compose them, what do you get is for something, right? And so what I'm saying is when you do one and one, you compose those arrows. What's the equivalent arrow from this W object to itself? Well, it's 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 another one of these um, morphisms from this dummy object to itself, and that corresponds to one plus one over here. You see what I mean? So if you go around one, one, and you compose those, you do one after one. What's the equivalent one that combines both of those by composing them? Well, it's two. It's this blue guy here. Hmm? Remember with composition. For any two end to end arrows, we have to specify if we do one after the other, like that, what's the equivalent arrow from the very start to the very end, right? That's what composition rule gives us for categories, right? When we specify a category, that's the main way we describe structures, we specify this composition rule. So if we have two arrows, Say say that we call this X and we call this Z in this category or this this object Y is here. Remember, composition says if you do F after or sorry G after F, right? If you do G after F, mm -hmm. so F first and then G, and you can say no, F that seven G, right? What's the equivalent arrow from doing this? You do this. What's the equivalent arrow from X to Z, right? Mm -hmm. So you can imagine these are two programs, F and G. This one, F maybe takes a string and turns it into lowercase, and G counts the number, I don't know, the number of lowercase a's in that string or something like that. Um, the, the composite of it would take a string and give you back the number of lowercase a's if you turn it into a, if you turn it into a lowercase string, right? So what I'm saying is the composite of two arrows, that's when you specify category, you have to specify for any two end-to-end -end arrows what their composite is going from the very start of the first to the very end of the second, right? And so for a monomer, you have to specify if you compose one with one, what do you get? Hmm? And if you're encoding natural numbers with plus and you do one and one, what's the equivalent of that composition? One and one, what's the equivalent? It's two. Hmm? And if you do one more, one and one and one, or you do two and one, or you do one and two, and arrow two, what do you get then? Three. Three, right? Okay. Um, now this is the free model. Now, I want you to think about this. Is it true that every composition here gives a new error? Is that really true? That every composition gives a new arrow? Every composition that doesn't involve the identity. Okay, so so one and zero would give one, one and zero and one would give one. one. Okay. 
Larissa, you have your hand up, and or Tony. Excuse me. Or um, uh, I like the way you're thinking, Tony. I think you say if you keep low on one, up to two, and you do the longest. That is exactly right. So it has to be. What does that smell like? One after two is the same as two after one. It smells like what? It smells like a dozy divot, right? It's like two after one might be like one plus one plus one. It must be for what? One plus one plus one. One plus one. Right? Now, of course, if, if a class uh, uh, fifth graders came in and saw this, they think, that's what they study at university. <laughs> but, um, but this is a subjectivity, right? Remember, remember for a category, it has to be associative with respect to composing these things. So it, this has to be the case because in a category, plus is what? How do we capture com composition, right? So if we compose the one arrow with the the or if we compose first um, two one arrows in a row, we can get a, an arrow out from that, and then we compose it with one. It has to be the same as composing them with the other, right? Um, doing first uh, first one and then the other two, right? So if we did, never mind that these are the same object, right? If we do this, if we have one. Right? And we compose it with one, right? And then with one again. And we consider this composite here. Remember, these objects are actually the same, but that's fine. This composite and then doing one again must be the same as doing this, right? I'm uh, doing this first one and then doing this composite here, right? But that's what associativity says for categories. It, we don't have to put parentheses around this, right? Uh, it doesn't matter if we do these two first, we compose them and then compose with this, or if we do this one first and then compose with this. Remember that? That was a feature of, of, of uh, categories. Tony, are you going to say something? Um, hmm. Oh, I'm by on this. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so here, it's not strictly true that any, composing any two things yields a totally new thing every time. No, 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 no. But it does, it's as free as possible within the limits of what a category's rules are, which are, have, have to do with associativity and unitality. If you compose with zero, with one, it's the same as composing, you know, zero and one is the same as one and zero, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it turns out that that um, associativity constrains it some, but within those limits, it's very free. It's very free. You know, any two things you combine within these limits, you get a new one. Right? Do, do, do you do you understand that? Do you, are, are you feeling comfortable with that? Okay. So let's. So yes. So, so sorry. So, yes. No. No. Uh, if uh, I want to uh, draw uh, for uh, non-negative phenomena uh -huh. or uh, more than zero, uh -huh. uh, it's the, the, uh, the operational combination between multiplication and uh, the bond and an identity element uh, is bond. And I think uh, mm -hmm. I should. Um, I should uh, connect uh, every error. Uh, error. Uh, for example, one is uh, one uh, multiplication, one, two. Right, uh, right. Equal one. Right, so if you were dealing with instead of, instead of um, N, N mm -hmm. you were dealing with like whole numbers like one, two, three, four, five, you know, things strictly greater than zero here, Not, you know, uh, integers greater than zero. Right, um, Z plus, I think it's instead of sometimes you write it in times. Then what would the what would the unit be for that? What would be the thing when you combine with anything else? 
gives the same thing back. For times, it, what would the unit be? One. Well, one times anything is that thing, right? So like one times three is three. One times five is five. Times. It's times. Yeah. 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 If this were times. Yeah. So here, what you would you would have a mapping. Um, each of these arrows would correspond to some number over here. Um, but composition, but zero would the identity arrow would map to what? One over here. And and then because when you combine with anything else, you get that thing back. And composition over here would correspond to what over here? Times. Times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just illustrating that correspondence. So, so for that one, one, one composition one, would it yield one again? No, right? Um, I'm sorry, would it yield two again? No, it would yield one, right? Be one times one, right? Um, to, to composition one, the two loop followed by the one loop. If you compose them together, you get some arrow from the dummy, from the dummy object to itself. And what would that object be if you do two and then one? It's not three, instead it's two for this one where you're dealing with whole numbers and times, right? We're, we're, just, we're examining that as a, because of the question, it's an alternative. So you could construct this like that, and it would have equivalent over there. Um, and some things would be true, like one times two would need to be the same as two times one, et cetera. Um, uh, and, and, and that would be, uh, that would be able to be captured. Now, here with n plus and zero, this is the free, this is the free monument. And in fact, uh, Nona, this is the one you were just um, uh, you were just talking about, right? For the first of these, composing the morphism, you know, if we captured this categorically, ID would be zero. Composing the morphism corresponding to three and another corresponding to two would give five. Mm -hmm. Remember composing takes any pair of arrows in and gives us a new arrow. And if we add the loop from this thing to itself for three and another one, this thing to itself for five, we compose and we get some arrow from this thing to itself. And which one would it be? I'm sorry, one and three, one for two. If, if you compose, you get the one for five. Hmm? That's part of the composition rule that would encode this. This one, the second one here, ID means one, would mean one. And so remember, we're designing our category. What does this mean, right? ID here will mean one, composing the morphism, the way in which we specify the category, we say what the composition rule, the composition rule we choose would make the morphism corresponding to three, composing that with the morphism corresponding to two, both of which look like something coming back here, right? Just like, um, oh, I, don't, I, I guess I don't, don't have a nice picture of it, but three, oh, three and two, if I compose them and this one, my, my rule for composition would say that, that give back the one from six, from the dummy object to itself as six. You could do max too. This two is a what? These are showing different what? It begins with N. Yeah, but specifically monoids, right? These are different monoids, right? Is this a monoid? Yeah, it's a monoid. Max with max of an, so we're considering natural numbers, zero, one, two, three, and, and with four, et cetera. And then if we take the max of any number in zero, like we take the max of any of those numbers in zero, say three and zero, what do we get back? Three. Five and zero, we get back five. five. So zero is the what? I, Identity, yes, the unit. 
for that mono. And so by the, the identity arrow here will be interpreted as zero in composing three and composing that with two. The arrow, you know, this this one here for this one here for three, the red one and the blue and the lighter blue one, the baby blue one, would yield what? For max, it would yield what? It would yield the max of three and two, which is what? Three. Three. Yeah. So remember, when we specify a category, we choose the composition that encodes our structure. And what I'm saying is, we could choose a composition rule for any of these, but we would also, beyond just the composition rule, there's one other thing that's part of structure. What is it? The identity, the choice of the identity. So we choose our identity, which is our identity arrow. Um, it's, you know, or, sorry, sorry. Um, for our identity arrow, what does it mean when interpreted in terms of this? This, this rule. So uh, identity serves here as, as zero because when we take the max of it with anything else, we get that something else, right? Um, among that, right? Max of one and zero is one. Max of 10 and zero is 10. Max of, you know, no matter what we take the max of among the natural numbers, we get that thing. Max of that and zero, we get that thing. Does that make sense? Um, uh, yeah, so some questions, all right. Um, so if we were to construct the, the multiplication category there, the, the model, yeah. would we, so in plus, we had a single arrow that could generate all of them, but in this case, would, if you only have a single arrow, say that was as two, then wouldn't that only powers of two, not the whole natural numbers? Right, so I think, um, so, so I think what you're saying is suppose we were to focus on this monoid here, right? Yeah. So now, um, now instead of plus over here, we have, we have times and the, the details over here are a bit different, right? Because one times three is the same as three times one would equals three, right? um, uh, et cetera. And identity here is one, right? And then we would have, I think what you're saying is we wouldn't generate all these numbers here mm -hmm. by just iterating a single one like plus one, plus one, plus yeah. one. With, with the, uh, the plus, if we just keep on adding one, we get everything else. But there's no corresponding one like that mm -hmm. right. for, for Tom's, right? Yeah. And that's exactly correct. That's exactly right. No, it doesn't say you couldn't have uh, a loop for zero and uh, a loop for, excuse me, a loop for one and, and, a, and a loop for uh, two. And in fact, you could have a loop for, for, for uh, zero as well, right? Um, you multiply it times anything, you get zero. Um, but it couldn't have one generated. That's correct. Does that mean that it's not a free model? Next? It's not, I think it's not a free model. Okay. Next. Yes. Um, I think, no, I could be pillared for this, but I was wondering this as I was talking here. And I, I think it's specifically natural numbers with plus and zero that correspond to the free model, the monoid that's, um, that's free, that's minimal restrictions. I think the, the times monoid. If I'm not mistaken, I think it's no longer a free monoid. Um, so you would have to import the restriction on it for the zero. The zero, precise, yeah. precisely what I'm thinking. Larissa, yes, brilliant. That's right. Larissa, yeah. First, the free monoid is considered a natural number generation, the free monoid is on one generator, then this would be more than one generator. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that could be. I I have to think what that would imply. Infinite like, generators, one for each prime number. Something like that. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. One for each prime number. Yes, I think that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So so this is mono. Now, again, when I saw this the first time, I was like, 
think what the heck is this dumb object? Like, does that represent secretly all the purchase or something? Uh, the dummy object is just something for us to hang these things on. You know, it's, it's just, and, and so we can compose all of them, right? The fact that everything goes back to the same dummy object means we can compose anyone with anyone, which is what we can do with the model. We can add any element to any element. So this free monoid um, turns out to be a really nifty little, um, little construct. And she talks about it, Eugenia Cheng talks about it um, beautifully um, in this section on, you know, on, on pages like 127 and 128, et cetera, right? Um, um, so, uh, here, um, she, she says, um, for 127, she talks about the natural numbers are the essential example of a monoid under, under addition, under addition. And later we get this idea of formal meaning by saying they're free monoid and one generates is what the research was referring to. Uh, apologies for the gap in English. Um, this encapsulates the fact that we arrived at the natural numbers right at the start of the section by taking one object and one uh, arrow in a loop and composing repeatedly to make a new arrow each time. And she's referring to that very first section, that little, the final one that, that she shows in that first section here. Um, uh, this is on page 125. It's a, it's a loop. Um, so she has a, an object and he has, and always this object has a Y. And not strong mm -hmm. it's an identity, right? Almost there, right? Um, and we'll call it ID star or whatever. But then there's a loop beyond that identity. It's a loop, but it's not the identity. No, 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 no. It's, it's, it's maybe you know, something we might call F, right? Um, um, uh, and, and she says, this diagram by itself is ambiguous. She says, uh, not, uh, this is not, this is not Right, that's what I'm saying. This one, there is an identity, but there's a separate one that's not. This is not a, the one that's shown there because we don't draw identities. It's always there, rooted in, in, in uh, dialogue, just to emphasize that it's not this one. This one is something else. We'll call it F, right? And what she says is, um, first, we need to specify that the loop is not identical. Okay, fine. Um, uh, then we need to specify what happens when we compose it um, as it is now composable with itself. Why is it composable with itself? It's end to end with itself, right? You can compose it with itself, right? So we can do F after F, which will write as what? F squared. F squared, right? Um, so it's to make it quite right. Um, if we go around the loop twice, does that make a new arrow? Or does it just keep making a new arrow every time? Uh, so in other words, does it just keep making a new arrow every time we go around it? Um, and if so, we're no longer in a drawable category. Now we're getting into monos if each time we go around it. But she notes that this is ambiguous. What, what, what else could F be, for example, here? What, what what could F be that wouldn't imply any other loops here? If, if going around this in a circle yields, if F squared is something different, we should really draw, right? Um, and if F cubed is something different, we should draw. But let's suppose that, that we have this with F, and I'm, I'm arguing it's possible when she says this category is this drawing of the category, this presentation of the categories is ambiguous. She says this diagram may be ambiguous. We have to specify more things. Give me something that F squared could be that doesn't require drawing the new arrow. What could F squared be? Yes. It could be F. So it could be one possibility is that F squared is in fact F. In fact, we've drawn all that category. We've drawn it. We wouldn't need it to draw any additional loops, right? What else could F squared be? Well, put it apart from that's one possible. What else could F squared be that wouldn't involve drawing any other arrows? Yeah, it could be identity. 
F could be its own inference. You square it and you get back to identity, right? That's possible, right? Mm -hmm. F squared could be identity, right? Could you imagine a monoid where F squared gives uh, identity? Like maybe F is add one to things. Can you imagine a, a mathematical structure where if you add one twice in a row, you add one and then add one, you get back to kind of where you were started? Yes. Yeah, odd what? Two. That's the thing which one of my parts is computer science, right? Mod two, right? Like this, this would come up in mod two. This would come up when we're dealing with bits. Zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, right? We start with zero. We add one to it. We get something different. We get one. But we do it again. Add one again. Right squared. And we're back to zero. We're back. Back. Back to our, our starting point, right? And this is what she's talking about on page 126, right? Where she says, um, uh, I'm sorry, um, it's, it's uh, page 128, where she says at the top, 128, if instead we impose an equation on some of these composites, like x squared equals um, one, in other words, identity. Notice she's writing one as kind of identity. Um, at least it means as, as unit, um, uh, then it would no longer be a free model that you can post constraints. For example, you could declare that f squared is anywhere, f cubed is anywhere, but f to the fourth equals one. Or we could just say f squared equals one, right? Um, remember, one, what, what is the serving the role of one here um, uh, in this? What's serving the role of one? When we're when we're um, doing the composition, what's one? It's mm -hmm. when you compose it. See, you you can write something, right? One composed with f equals f. So one is representing the identity loop. It's representing this loop. So we could have a situation. This is why it's ambiguous. Where f squared is identity, or we could have another one. Alternatively, that's one possible. Thing this could be, we need to specify it. We need to write this down. If that were the case, f squared equals one. Um, or equals identity so star we want. Or we could add f squared equals f. That would be another thing that we draw in the same way, but with different different equations, instead, right? Um, uh, but a free monoid will be every time that's possible. That's within the the rules of categories is possible, it'll be a new one, right? And we have lots of these arrows, just like it's shown in my diagram, right? And we each time we add one, we get a new one. And, 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 you know, it's one, it's one, but one, one, one. I have a new term to the next one. Yeah. I'm thinking of the possibility of like what Berkeley yeah. is not a number and it's a mean, and then it's a thinking Yes. Okay, so you're you're absolutely right. If you had min here, what would you need as unit? You want to take something so that the minimum of you want to have something, it's gonna be our unit, such that when you take the minimum of anything with it, you get that other thing back, right? Um uh, so, so what would serve as unit here? You, you referred to that. Infinity. infinity, right? The problem is infinity technically is wow. not a natural number. So we could make it in, you know, natural numbers plus infinity. <laughs> plus, I mean, you can stick infinity in that set, right? You say, oh, well, I'll have an infinity Arrow, but but then we can't reach anything, right? Um, but um, you you could do that. But min is is different in that sense. This will come out 
potentially later in the sports as well. Like men, you might think men and max or eh, kind of the same thing, but um, one should be expressible if the other is very readily but men is required would require infinity, which technically is not part of that. Right? Um, if you add um, if you add Z here, meaning all what uh, not and negative. If you pause it and negative, which you have Z, right? Um here, then would zero serve as unit anymore? Maybe. No, because max of uh, negative numbers in zero would be zero, it wouldn't be the other thing. You're looking for something when you apply the operation max to it, it gives the other thing back, right? And zero would no longer function. I mean, I don't know. Oh, it'll be a remnant. Yeah. This one I'm looking at, uh, yeah. we compose to get a new thing, right? So, what do you do with reverse to kind of decompose to get another thing? Okay, so the, you're getting into it. So, we will do that later in this course. It's called co monoids. Co monoids. It's kind of monoids backwards. Whenever you hear co in category theory, it's Virtually a surefire situation. You're you're dealing with the with the kind of just flipped around the dual, and it turns out monoids you compose two things called, and I'm going to write it with this tensor symbol, but it's not tensor in a in a vector sense. It's, it's just a symbol to represent how the plate that works for whatever thing. Um, this is going to give some other elements, some elements to you, whatever, right? Um, but with a co-monoid. You're going to have like C, yes, decomposed into like A cross B. And it turns out these are super useful. Oh, they're, they come up a huge amount and um, they're, they're incredibly uh, relevant for dynamic systems. And for H based modeling, they can be uh, quite relevant actually in the context of polynomial functions. So, so this is. I love how you're thinking, and you will absolutely do that. It flipped around. Yes. Um, this is a bit of uh, stuff here, but I, so on the max, I understand how zero uh, is the identity, but I'm not sure I understand how composition would work. Like, how would you compose max? I, I, I swear, yeah, I suppose I don't understand what. Well, great, there. great question. So remember, when, remember when we define a category, it's almost like, it's so you could be forgiven for thinking you have to provide a table that says for any pair of morphisms, a table that might look like like this. <laughs> you know, for any pair of morphisms, you specify what the result is. Right? Well, when you specify a category, this is what you would provide. Um, and uh it might be something like like this. So you would say, you know, um if if you do the one, if you do the identity, what's their composite, etc. Now identity here is zero, right? <laughs> um, and so the idea the idea is that your rule here would just say that okay, if I take two composed with one, what would the result be? If, if it was max, what would the result be? Two composed with one would be two, because the max of two and one is two. Uh, three and three, the max would be what? Three. So you compose three and three, you get three. Um, you do five and three, you do composition, the composite of the loop five with the loop three. When you compose those, you get an equivalent component. Composed morphism that would be what five and three would give five. five. So is that is that a free one? No, it's not. It's it's giving it keeps on giving back a lot of these things, right? Um, but but we just specify it in our table that essentially specifies our composite. Like what's our composite? Does that make sense? Yeah. So then basically we just we can't use the the first arrow composed with itself over and over again to create all of the other arrows like we can with addition. Well we can't with addition is something special. 
Different is the free monoid under one generator. Under one generator. And it's it's beautiful. It's it's awesome. And we'll come back to it many times. But I want to tease you with, with a little something here that to just this may seem so divorced from what we're doing in our in our group, but this is actually from David Spivak and Brennan Fong's unbelievably good book, Seven Sketches in Compositionality. And uh, I've taken the liberty of having a few things that I think are really nice illustrations from there, but I want to whet your appetite. So it turns out that this is a category. It's a, it's a presentation of a category here. We have an object, single object. A, sim, a single non-identity morphism. That's where we draw it. What else is there that we don't draw? Identity morphism. Yeah. Um, this is the non-identity morphism, but it's called next, and this one is called state. This object, because this depicts discrete dynamical systems. You have a state. Think of the dynamics model with a certain state, and then you have an update rule that updates the state. Or think the game of life uh, in, 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 you know, a dynamical systems context. State is the state of the whole board, ones and zeros for all the patches, whether they are occupied or not. And then this is the game of life rule that updates the game of life to get back to a new state. And it's a free monoid because in general, each time you iterate it, you know, iterating it three times is different than iterating it two times, it's different from iterating it 10 times in general, right? Um, and so it'll be described by a, a free monoid on this, this the category presented uh, here. So this is discrete dynamical systems. Get a load of that. And it turns out this, this looks kind of weird, but probably two lectures from now, you will see it's actually like this is the schema category for it, and and that's going to seem a little bit weird that I'm using that word for databases, but we'll see why. But basically, it, this by itself is kind of neat. Yeah, it's neat um, idea, but it's really when we map it into set state will become a set of a set representing the current situation. Maybe like the state of all the 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 board for game of life. Mm -hmm. um, and next, we'll map to a function that updates that. So really what this is going to be is kind of, it's really the mapping between this and the category set, where if this object maps to a specific set, this morphism maps to a specific function. That's going to be a particular dynamical system that updates, okay? Um, now, that will seem a little bit weird, but we have to get to the notion in chapter 13 of functor. And then that's going to open up that whole beautiful thing for us. And I want to go through this, this, um, this notion a little bit more. So, so guess what this is? It's the schema category for graphs. Yeah, so we have a, a, a particularly directed multiplexers, um, so we have these, we have these vertices, and we have the arrows between them, directed arrows, um, and we can have sometimes multiple arrows between them, we have a pair of vertices here, um, so I'm just drawing out a graph, right? drawing out a graph, um, and Try to understand what's going on. Now, that's often useful to think like, okay, source maps from an arrow to a vertex. Target maps from an arrow to a vertex. Arrows refer to these edges. You might call them edges, call them arrows, like these guys in the graph. What do I mean by source maps to a vertex? What is it? What does it say? Let's go with that number all of these, these, these vertices. I'm going to. I'm going to label this vertex one, two, oh, maybe I'll, I'll label them A, B, C, B. I'll give you just a second on um, A, B, C, D, E, F. Okay. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'll, 
I'll label these edges one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, six, seven, eight. Okay. So what do I mean that arrow has a thing that maps called source that maps to vertex? And it has a thing called target and that's what, what do you think that says by an arrow like one? What would the source be? A. a, what would the target be? B, B, exactly. How about four, arrow five? Source is what? B, B. B. C, A is the target, that's right. I mean, um, no. could have a two direction. Uh, if you have two directions, you could have like this, have uh, sorry, you could have something like that. So that, but, a given arrow is only one direction. So this other arrow would be, we might call it arrow nine. If source would be what? B and its target would be B. Now again, you might think, well, that's kind of weird. Yeah, oh, okay, so we can imagine. But again, where this is gonna shine, where this is gonna be really interesting is when this maps into set, because each of the arrows, well, we're coming. So arrows would correspond to a set. And guess what the set here would be of arrows? One, two, three, four, exactly. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And the set of vertices would be what? A, B, C, D, E, F. That's a set, right? Set, A, B, C, D, E, F. Set of arrows is a set. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, right? And Guess what? If that's a set, and that's what a set, guess what source is going to be? It's going to be a what between sets? Function. It's going to be a function. It's going to map each of the arrows, one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine. For example, if it went into the vertices, the set of vertices, one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, right? Um, yeah. Uh, um, so, for example, that function would map one, the source function would map one into what? For, for source. Okay. A. That's a member. So, a member of the arrow set will map into the member of the vertex set. Right? And for every arrow, we know source will map that arrow to its source, to the element of the vertex set. Do you see that? So, so right now it looks kind of weird, but what I'm saying is we'll soon discover that with functors, we're going to map this into set and this will make the world of sense. Right now it's kind of a cool idea that gives, and you can think of it as kind of saying arrows map, you know, source, the source morphism maps from an arrow to a vertex. It, it tells for a given arrow, what its source vertex is. Kind of makes sense, but it's really when it maps into the set that all sorts of neat things will happen. Oh, uh, yeah, Aaron. So, uh, so then that drawing uh, from that previous slide oh, sorry. Would, yeah. be, uh, would be a complete representation of a category, and that category represents the schema of how we construct a graph. And if we were to zoom in on that, then you would need to get something that more like yeah, yeah. So, so this is the schema. It kind of specifies the data and relationships that are needed to specify a graph. And mapping it to set will be an instance of a graph. It'll be a particular graph. And by the same token, by the same beautiful token, glorious token, this, when you map it into set, this specifies the data you need to specify a dynamical system. And when you map them to set, it will be a particular dynamical system, like the game of life, or like the 3D version of the game of life, or like the game of life, which allows cells to be born if either they have one, two or three neighbors or whatever. It'll be a particular dynamical system. You see what I mean? Yes. Okay, now, just to whet our appetite within our group. Um, well, okay, so we'll soon be seeing how this works for databases because the same basic notes occurs in databases. Like 
You have a, a table of employees, so a set of employees, a set of departments. There'll be a work simulation, which is a foreign key that maps from a given employee to a given department. There'll be an employee mapping to employee that sells the manager, a particular employee who the manager is. This will be the same basic idea. Um, uh, but I wanna I wanna give you some taste of how this will apply for a stock and blood item. So here we have a particular stock and blood item. And here is a category defined by our very own Jayan Lee in a lab, which specifies how to the information needed to specify. It. So this is the schema that describes the information needed to specify a stock load item. And the names are a bit brief, but basically here, V corresponds to dynamic variables, things like um, the prevalence of infection, which is you know I over N, for example, here. F V will be some variables into like S plus I plus R. S, guess what that is? Stocks. F, guess what that is? <laughs> Flows. That's right. And there's this relationship between stocks and flows um, and the degree to which we have outgoing flows from a stock or incoming flows into a stock that are captured here. Um, and, and then there are some things like LV that describe how a variable depends on a given stock. So for example, V prevalence depends on the stock I. It for for this variable v prevalence. Remember, kind of what we map to with this the set of map to by v. We will have a relationship that says that that variable depends on stock. Uh, okay, um, and uh, that's um, that's going to allow us to sort of keep track of of the uh, dependencies here. This uh, LSV will specify on what stock, uh, excuse me, what variables, right, what variables um, uh, a given some variable will will depend on. And, uh, or, think about it. or variables can depend on other variables. Um, here, that's the LVV, uh, et cetera, and P is sort of parameters. You sort of like, fixed values um, here, like C or beta or T red. So it turns out, we'll unpack this more later, but this is going to be for that same idea of mapping to set. The, it specifies the information we need to specify stock flow diagram. Of course, it's nothing specific, just to stock flow diagrams. This is what's called the Petri map, where we have places and we have rates of transition between these places, okay? Um, and uh, for example, going from full immunity to partial immunity, you, there's a transition called waning one from partial to back down to full, fully susceptible will be waning two. And these are transitions. Um, and for each transition, we have a set of inputs and there can be more than one here in a Petri net. Uh, it can encode things like um, something like CO2 to form, or, or H2O might be a, a better one. H2O, it depends on two hydrogen and one, one oxygen. And so that transition might need three things, two hydrogen and one oxygen. Um, so each transition has inputs that it needs to fire and outputs the things it puts there. So as Tony said, um, what was relating earlier, um, you might split things in this case, right? So you might have things like, I don't know, um, uh, uh, salts can be broken up into Na and Cl under certain energetic conditions or whatever. Um, and the idea is the resources are consumed upon use. It's a different notion than stock and flow diagrams, but
But the idea here is that, oh, where's my, uh, where's my, where's my nice slide on, on, on uh, those, hey, come on, hey, come on. Um, where's my nice slide on, on this? Is it somehow hidden? Oh, goodness. Let, I'll get, what the heck? Okay, sorry. Um, that's really odd. Um, I don't know. I have it here. It is. There it is right there. Well, we'll copy it. So I can give it to you as part of the correct diagram. Here we go. Oh, no, not that one. No, it's interesting for other reasons. Come on. Come um, on. Uh, here we go. Here is the one. Hey. Nice. Darn thing. So, come on. Come on. Yes, there it is. So here we have S is places, T is transitions, and each transition has things on which it depends for the inputs and things on which it depends for the outputs. And uh, inputs come from a certain state and, and outputs come from a certain state and both state and transition have names. So this is a schema, again. And that schema will define Petri means. So it's not that this schema directly directly encodes a Petri net, but when we when a Petri net like this would be an instance of a Petri net, like the one we just saw, this one right here, would be specified by mapping the such a set. Okay. So so here we have these small categories, and um, these small categories turn out to be extremely relevant for our work. And within the next week, I'm going to see if I can get us going. Eric's already going on it, but the rest of us will we'll see if we can get going on using CatLab and Algebraic Julia, which will allow us to define these categories and map them into sets. Okay. So we'll be able to define schema categories and and map them into set and do neat categorical things with them. Okay, which will be kind of cool. Um, so um, I hope you know you if you're feeling queasy about this um, about this notion of kind of monoids and this notion if it seems weird to you. Let it sit as as Eugenia Cheng says, it's okay. Like that's okay. Um uh you know, you can she says notes on the dimension shift. This is page 127. This is a mental shift from perspective and abstraction. Um it's important, so we'll be coming back to it several times. If you find it confusing, then I think you may well be on the right track. Um I still remember feeling completely confused by the shift the first time I see it and feeling slightly dizzy and, and I don't know if I'm going to fully pronounce this, but uh, uh, vertiginous, um, so with vertigo. Um, I think that leaps of attraction can often feel like this, and that vertigo is a bit like looking over the end, uh, edge of an abstract cliff. And as she says, um, uh, you know, I, uh, the important thing I think is to know that if it feels weird to you, you're not wrong, you're not doing badly. If it feels completely fine to someone else, it might be because they're really an attraction, but it might be also because they haven't gotten it. So it's a bit, it's it's a bit weird, but it's it's weird in a way that's gonna grow on you. It's weird in a way that's actually ends up being freeing. Um, and if you can come to terms with it, you'll be able to sort of uh, grow. And and start to understand um, how to how to understand a variety of things in category two. Um, so let me ask about groups. Um, yes, please, please. No, no. Uh, can you describe the inverse of elements? Is there a, like a different direction of uh, elements? The the inverse of elements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. But by element here, what do you talk about vertex? Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say that a vertex typically has an 
Okay. Yeah, please. Uh huh. Events element in the body. Oh, okay. So what's the like what is the inverse yeah. in the body? So this is. So this graph is not actually itself represented by a monoid. This graph is illustrating this schema category and how it might encode you map it to set in ways we're going to talk about rigorously using the notion of a functor if you get this graph. This is not illustrating monoids by itself. Um, monoids were illustrated more along the lines of, of, of this. And here um, we have things like three monoids where as much as possible when we compose things, we get new things, but we're bound, we're constrained inevitably by the logical rules of needing associativity, right? Um, so you may say f and f and g, and f and g is h, that's all gray. But even with a free monoid, if you say g and f, it turns out that has to be h for associativity. There, there's going to be associativity. f after f. f, sorry, f, f after f has to be the same as f, f first, and then f. And so it turns out these two have to have to correspond to A. So this is a free monoid. There's going to be times where we have non-free monoids. Um, and I don't know if we have a nice one. Well, here. Um, what is this monoid code? So it's a fun one. It's a, it's a fun one. <laughs> Sorry, Mo monoids don't really illustrate a graph. Um, uh, Larissa, yeah. Um, yes. Um, but using, um, uh -huh. but using the mm -hmm. zero and one. Yeah, mod, mod, mod two, mod two. We have zero. What's that? That's the unit, right? It, it's it an identity, yeah. You know? um, if we add it to anything, we get that thing back. Whatever we add it to, we get that other thing back. And then we have one. And you notice identity, 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 right? And here, here, and here, right? Um, one, two. Yeah. Identity of one, you get what? One. one. So if you compose identity, this is forced by a category, isn't it? By the rules of a category, if you compose identity with one, you have to get the one back, right? You don't have any choice. I don't know. Um, one in identity, by the same rule of the category, you have to get that one back. It's really this one, right? No pun intended. Um, one in one, we compose to be what? Identity. identity. Right? It's, it's this guy, it's this guy here. Right, so that's zero. We're back to zero, right? Um, so this is mod two. You write right up there, mod two, right? Um, which um, is not a free monoid, right? We, we've added constraints, um, but it kind of comes up zero one, zero one, zero one, zero one as you add, as you keep on adding one, right? Are you are you comfortable with that? What I'm saying is, where negatives come in here is when we start having um, monoids um, that particularly aren't over the naturals with plus, but are instead with with what? When do we start having negatives? Mm -hmm. When do we start having inverses? Yeah, we start having inverses, right? Um, and and particularly inverses do what? So if you what what's the role of an inverse? Return to the identity. Return to the identity. That's right. So like minus one undoes what? One. 
minus two undoes one, two. It brings you back to the identity. Yeah. But where did those come up specifically? Those do those come up with the natural numbers? If you do natural plus and zero, consider that monoid. Do you get those? No, because it's, it's free and you do nothing which kind of cancels out of nothing. Do you get them with with uh where do you get them when you're looking beyond the naturals to the what? Yeah, the integers, the integers. And so you'll notice that um sorry? Zero has an inverse. Zero has an inverse, and what is that? Zero. That's right. Um it's a particularly nice inverse, right? Elegant inverse. Um, but she says, you know, for uh, like in that things to think about, try filling in the multiplication tables for the numbers one, three, five, seven, you know, in, in Z, Z8 and, and um, uh, that's right, in, in this uh, Z mod eight um, uh, type of, of rule, right? Um, and and uh, the idea is that a group uh, is represented by a groupoid. It's a character in which every arrow has a what? Inverse. That's kind of cool idea, right? Now we have arrows that are inverses of each other. I think this is what Nono was getting at before. That you might have one one morphism, right? Um, which goes. Uh, which goes uh, composes with another. So you have like minus minus n composed with n gives what? Yeah, which is how represented how categorically? Identity. Identity. Um, and so here we could represent categorically um, using a monoid, um, this notion of, um, uh, of, of uh, okay, so right. Um, uh, so you know what she says, categorical definition of a group. A group is a category with only one element, one object. What's that? What's the other thing we've been looking at, which is one object? Uh, monoid as one object, right? The dummy object, right? Star such that every arrow has an inverse, right? Um, first condition ensures we have mono. The second says a mono with inverses. Now we can relax this definition by dropping the second condition. We'll get back to mono. So we could instead relax the first, uh, this definition by dropping the first condition. And a groupoid now can have multiple, could start to have multiple objects, okay? Um, a group is a category with one object such that every arrow has an inverse. But a groupoid is a category where every arrow has an inverse, but it might have more than one object. Um, so that's kind of an interesting idea. You have inverses of an arrow because composing that arrow with its inverse gives what? Identity. Kind of undoes. One arrow undoes another, right? Normally, we don't think of that like in an obvious way, this kind of like matter and antimatter, they combine, right? Um, so, can you say that I give an arrow mm -hmm. inverse of itself? Mm -hmm. uh, if, if an arrow is the inverse of itself, I, I suspect in, in a group context that it has to be that dead. Yes, I think that's correct. I believe that's correct, but in which case, it also yeah yeah it it is the idea yes exactly um, I think that's that's right and you notice her comment about algebraic here this is I thought really interesting because no one ever told me this in school I wish they had told me that right um, uh, she said that um, group theory is a classic research field pure mathematics of the best quality of knowledge and techniques. Uh, for this reason, many advances in other areas of math have come from finding a way to make a link to group theory. This is often indicated by putting the word algebraic, you know, before a field of, of, of research because group theory is a form of algebra. Um, and 
And we'll see what algebras are likely in this class. There, there's a notion of algebra and category theory. It's a beautiful uh, notion, and it's really linked in with some concepts of computer science. For example, uh, it's related to catamorphisms and anamorphisms, and so algebras and co-algebras and, and initial algebras, et cetera, which you know, come up quite a bit in reasoning but computation. Um, so algebraic geometry, algebraic topology, algebraic number theory, uh, et cetera. Um, so uh, we have algebraic stock flow now because we have stock flows encoded kind of in that categorical form. And we can reason about, you know, these um, manipulating them algebraically. Um, Okay, uh, I would go on, but I have to go get a blood test. Um, so I'm gonna need to wrap up now, unfortunately. Um, but remember that I've asked you to read the chapter on sets and functions for next time, okay? And hopefully we'll get a bit of a chance to also talk about the exercises that I asked you to undertake, okay, um, as well. Now, how do I, okay, okay, now I'm, I'm in a pickle. Um, here is my Zoom, okay. Um, no, okay, where's my, how do I get back to my Zoom? Oh, oh there we are, okay. Uh, there we go, okay. Uh, and I'll stop sharing. Oh. Hey. hey, okay, there we go. Okay, and, well, oh, where's my mouse? Okay, oh, there we go. Okay.